All right, so Three Ninjas Podcast, Domino has Jones, Bobby. And right now we have on the phone, um, I've been wanting to talk to somebody from the uh, South Park land for a little while, and I'm glad I got this person on the phone to actually chop it up with them and see, uh, you know, just to get to know some things about the show and I guess their career in general. So right now we have actor, writer, director. Um, she's been the voice of Izzy on Digimon and Sheila Broflowski on South Park and various other shows. We have Mona Marshall on the phone right now. Mona, how are you? Hey. Hello. I'm good. I'm really good. <laughs> now, um, to start with, I want to, uh, to know, originally you wanted to study theater and you went to LA for that, but then somehow you found your way into voice acting. Now, how does one fall into voice acting, but go to LA for theater? Well, first of all, one does not, at least in my case, fall into voice acting. <laughs> okay. That would be the first thing. Second thing is I started out with a degree in English mm -hmm. and had come out to LA because my Shakespeare teacher had told me when I wanted to study theater that LACC at that time had an outstanding theater de uh, department and program, which they did. Mm -hmm. So I came out here to study. And during that time, I, uh, with no idea of what voiceover really was, but during that time, um, one of my classes in voice production was taught by a man named Robert C. Board, who really talked about the fund fundamentals of how to use your voice. Mm -hmm. Now, he was thinking primarily uh, for stage and for film, but I have never forgotten what it is he taught. So I knocked around L.A. and um, never quite fit into whatever pigeonhole uh, they often try and fit you in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was teaching at um, a professional school for actors, and one of my students was uh, studying with Dawes Butler. He was a fifth grader. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard of Dawes Butler. I didn't know who he was. As it turned out, he was the voice of Yogi Bear and Quick Draw McGraw, Captain Crunch. And she kept nudging me to go to this workshop. And to keep her quiet, I went. Mm -hmm. And when I did, it opened up a whole new world for me. But one of the things that I think bugs most voice, most actors who are primarily voice actors is that there is some difference between acting and voice acting. Okay. Dawes used to say, if you cannot act in a 30 second commercial, maybe you can't act. Hmm. So, um, every skill I learned as an actor, uh, for theater, I have been able to apply in voiceover. Now, how do you discover that you can do voices, though? Like, you can, you know, change the pitch or the tone of your voice to actually... Well, mm -hmm. part of that I learned in that voice production class because our assignment every week was to take a classical piece, um, either from uh, the Greeks or from Shakespeare, take a monologue, and be able to use the various parts of our voice. Okay. So we had already learned those, and if uh, any of your people listening uh, have gone on to my, uh, my YouTube channel and heard Voices for Fun, I talk about all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really pay attention and listen, besides hopefully being entertained, I really do show you and tell you how to use those different aspects of your voice, which means there are ways to work in a higher range and also in a lower range. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, and then I studied, at the same time, I was studying opera. Um, I was also studying improvisation and used to, um, off the wall, had a little uh, branch uh, where we went into a, a club at that time, I think it was called The Rose. Mm. And basically, people would give us three words and we had to connect them via, you know, phony opera. Mm. And the great thing about opera is you're holding on a note for a long enough time to figure out what a rhyme might be. Right. So, and also an improv class, and uh, I briefly, as a as a guest, went to Brian Cummings' uh, workshop and realized that I could do children, mm -hmm. and uh, especially little boys. Mm -hmm. I have the right range for that. So a lot of my little boy voices came out of that, mm -hmm. and I created <laughs> actually a family with Margaret Elizabeth, who is um, five years old, and her older brother Mikey that would be me Margaret Elizabeth okay I can speak kid. for myself 
<laughs> and out of those two characters, I began to use exactly what I just told you. Part of it is knowing who your character is. Mm. For instance, this character who's kind of a smart ass is not going to be the same as this character who is not, even though the voice placement is basically the same. Mm. So, you know, in doing a role like Izzy, when I auditioned for that, um, Izzy from Digimon, they needed somebody because he was the computer whiz who could do exposition and do it quickly. Mm. So if you take a, a little boy voice about 10 years old, and you make sure that you're coming from an acting place where he's smart and he's quick, and you place that tone forward uh, right behind your teeth, what you're going to get is somebody who can speak really quickly and precisely and still get a point across, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he also has a very distinct sounding voice. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all acting. Now, acting and knowing how to play voice. Right. Now, I was watching the, uh, <clears throat> the Voices for Fun, and there are like five methods that you use, I guess, to change the voices. One is like nasal, then there's something with the jaw. Can you explain the five, I guess, types? Sure. Um, nasal. W what you're talking about is where you're directing right, air. Right, right, yeah. Okay, then and there's a reason why, you know, we, we work on breathing, because without support, you got nothing. Right. So... This is all about you being a director of your own airflow. So nasal is directed into the nasal, right? And mm. from that, you can do all kinds of variations. Like, so you go, you go from doing this to a little bit of adenoidal where you're stopping the flow into the nose mm. and you have adenoidal. So actually, they're really the same thing. Mm. One is where you're letting air flow to the nose and one is where you're stopping it. Okay. And then you have, um, uh, you have aural, which is where you direct the air into your jaw. Mm -hmm. And if any of you know who Jimmy Stewart is, that is his natural placement was very aural. Yeah, yeah. So well, he would talk like this, you know, I'm, 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 I'm Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> um, <laughs> and from there you can do, uh, once again, you have the placement, then you have to think in terms of what's the character. Mm. So you get, you if you wanted to do a really snooty little voice, like, you know, this one, you would have, you know, this is all right in my jaw, dear, you know, mm. but now I'm being very precise as opposed to, you know, if I wanted to make real, real <laughs> big jaw movement, then we go into the South and we got a whole different sound now, don't we, boy? Mm. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, and so that's, um, that's, ad, uh, I'm sorry, that's, uh, oral mm. and then guttural. Think in terms of that airflow slightly being slightly stopped as it goes over your vocal folds. So you have that kind of a sound, which I've used in all kinds of games. Right. Oh, yeah, looking real good there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then um, aspirate, that is where you're barely letting that air touch over your vocal folds. So it would be something like this. Oh, yes. I understand exactly what you want. And there is where you <laughs> really need to be able to articulate precisely. Hmm. And then the last one, five, there are some people, including it sounds like yourself, who have a very resonant sound. Hmm. That is the type of sound or placement we are, when you are using the very, how do I say this? It, it's the most resonant sound you have. It's the richest sound you have. It sounds like you have a lot of that naturally. I do not. Mm -hmm. the, the good part is that you'd probably be, you know, if you were wanting to do that, get a part of an announcer before I would. Hey. Because <laughs> that's the kind of sound you hear when you, that wonderful, oh, today we're going to see this character and she's going to do this. Mm -hmm. The, how you find that, though, I learned in that voice production class, and that is you find the lowest tone you can make comfortably. And then you work on a lot of NGs, NG sounds, hmm. like ring, king. There used to be an X. If you, if you take right now, take your finger and put it on the side of your nose, okay, up <laughs> near where... um where, uh, you know, you'd have your glasses, okay? Mm. Now, okay. Now, you should be able to feel this just on your own natural voice because you sound quite resonant. Right. But the exercise was you oh, find oh, the oh. lowest voice 
the lowest note. So mm. here we are. That's mine. And the exercise was the king is groaning and roaming around the room. And once you get into that placement, then you begin to work from there. So a lot of times if I'm doing narration or I'm doing a, vo- a, a voice that's, um, you know, like computer voice, it would be using that kind of sound. Mm-hmm. Okay. More of an announcer. So now, there you go. Now, five. Um, is there much room for improv when you do voiceovers <clears throat> or must you like stick to the script exactly? Well, it depends. In a lot of games, there there is, as long as you stay within the parameters of what they need in that, that line. Mm. Um, uh, certainly in original animation, there's tons of room. Um, once again, you, you, are, you are following the, what the writer has in mind. So, you know, it's like anything else. If you were doing a part in a film, mm. um, it depends. Most in my opinion, the better directors I've worked with allow for that room, but that also means that my responsibility is to stay in character and really know what's going on in the scene. Mm-hmm. Something like, um, so original animation, that's, it's a lot easier to do that. And usually I'll say, I'd like to try something. Um, when I'm doing dubbing things like, um, for Digimon, you have to match the sync of the characters. So there's less room and less the original script <laughs> needs a lot of rewriting in case, in, in which case there's more room for that. Mm. Um, uh, South Park, not really because how South Park is done is, you know, Trey writes everything, gets up and, and goes into the recording room and records. So by the time I get there, usually Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock, I'm listening to his voice and sometimes watching animatic and sometimes watching full animation. Mm. So my job in that instance is to kind of work backwards. What's really going on? You got to remember, Trey is a genius, mm. and you know yeah. all this is happening in his mind, and he's writing it, and then he's going in and recording it. Now sometimes that changes. By the time they get to whatever I'm doing, either Kyle's mom or I also do Butter's mom and Mrs. Clinton and Red. By the time they get to my character, the intent of the scene might have changed. Mm-hmm. So I sometimes um, I'm doing, you know, just the lines, but usually I'm listening to Trey. And it's very, very important as an actor to really figure out what he means by the way he's saying it. Right. Because, you know, it's not just a line. It's what's behind the line. Mm-hmm. And I find that very challenging, especially if I'm having to match sync as well. And um, the recording engineer down there uh, is just brilliant. You know, so I'm very fortunate. I get a lot of support from the from the um, script supervisor Mark and from Bruce, uh, who's the sound producer. You know, because they they have watched people go in. Oh, this is the way this scene is happening. Hmm. So they can give me really good in, uh, information input. Now, um, you took over the role of Kyle's mom in <clears throat> 1999. Now, before you took over that role, did you watch South Park prior? Never. Never. Uh, it, it, there's an interesting story behind that. And actually, technically, it was 2000, not 99. Okay. Because Mary Kay died in 99. Right. Mary Kay had uh, uh, had called me, and she couldn't say what the show was. So, But I knew she was doing this show. And then once she got the show and it was on the air, at that time, we used to do um, uh, voiceover people. We used to do benefits for various things. We did, uh, I think our first one was for AIDS. And so Mary Kay in 99, she and I were doing a benefit for vocal and we were in the chorus and, you know, she would talk about the show a little bit and how generous the guys were. Hmm. Um, I think at that time her mom had been diagnosed with cancer and did not have medical insurance. And um, she said they had been very generous in that capacity. Hmm. Um, so everyone in my business was totally shocked because that was August. Right. And she committed suicide in November. November, yeah. And, and, and an incredibly talented and very generous person. Mm-hmm. I mean, what got me through listening, because, you know, when the call came out that these, these the 
they were already in the season. And it was, so when the call came out that, you know, they need a replacement, the only thing that got me through listening to her voice without just falling apart was Mary Kay was the kind of person who would say to you, hey, listen, Mona, I, I'm not available for this, but you know what? You go. Take my blessing. Mm. And I mean it. That was exactly how she was. So, and especially November, every November, I think about that. Was it hard to make that character your own? Um, being a Jew, not really. Not really? <laughs> <laughs> you get somebody in her family like that. And, well, here's the thing. You find that in voiceover, there are certain rhythms you have. Mm. I had spent a few years doing Joan Rivers at conventions and for different things. And if you listen to Joan Rivers and you listen, oh, oh, come on, what are you doing? Get, get, wake up and smell the decaf. That's Joan. Right. Mrs. Roflowski is, Oh, Kyle, I had no idea. Chicken pox was such a dangerous idea. I'll tell you what, darling, don't let that, don't, don't you get sick on me because I will have a fit. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's bugging me out. <laughs> I mean, there, it, the, now that's where placement, not rhythm, because mm. they, they have very similar rhythm and not all the New York Jews sound the same either. Right. But um, Joan's placement was very throaty. Mm. Oh, 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 really? Oh, you think so? <laughs> and that wasn't just because of her age, because, you know, when I was doing her, she wasn't, you know, the age she was when she passed. Right. Um, Kyle's, oh, I don't think so. Kyle's mom, if you could see my face right now, mm. that's a lot more movement and a lot more space in the mouth. Mm. Now, South Park, the show, right, offends people on a weekly basis, right? Now, being mm -hmm. Jewish, Nothing in that show. Like, does anything offend you when it comes to this show? Like, anything they write, anything that Cartman says, just anything? You do know I'm I'm actually writing a, a series that yeah. we hope to sell called Adventures of Puss and Puss Dick. Puss and right? Dick, yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know when it, when it comes to people's sensibilities about their religion. I, I, that's, a, that's a whole different monster. Well, but, but here's know. the thing, honey. They skewer everybody. Right. There's not any... They they are really after skewering hypocrisy, mm -hmm. and in, in and most of us are ignorant about something. Right. You know, uh, there are people that don't have any idea what what a Jewish person, and not all Jews go through the same thing. Just like not all black people go through the same thing. All Mexican people don't go through the same thing. We all have differences. Part of what I think South Park does is it makes us aware. So that we don't stay in ignorance. Mm. And somebody who doesn't want to be aware is sure as hell not going to be watching South Park. Right. <laughs> true. Very true. So, I mean, we all are ignorant about something. And basically what they're saying is, well, you know, if you if you continue to be ignorant when you don't have to be, right. you got a problem. Yes. So, no, am I offended by it? No. Is it necessarily um, my favorite kind of comedy? Not necessarily. Okay. Doesn't mean it's not good. Right. You're right. Because I've been watching since you know? I was about eight years old and I haven't had a problem with, with anything yet. They, they've gone at everybody that uh, I can think of. Uh, no. And, and you grew up in a time, honey, that was a lot less conservative. Right. You know, I, I, I'm a little girl from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I'd have gotten slapped across the face many times. <laughs> right. A lot of what's on that show. Right. That's, you know, so our consciousness has been open more. And thanks to shows like South Park, my show that I'm working on, however, mm -hmm. deals more with the solution of those problems mm. rather than just the problem. And it's something that's been really close to me for about 10 years. This is not a, a you know, it really grew out of a, a relationship. The idea of, you know, people who are in a relationship, uh, a couple relationship, mm. but as the show has developed and um, now I'm actually working uh, with Mark Munley, who is a, a script supervisor for South Park, mm -hmm. who I've known now for 20 years. And when a friend who I had met, uh, who's a writer, mm. who does a lot of pitching of his own stuff, um, said to me, you know, you need more shock and awe. You need to work with somebody. The first person I thought of was Mark. So I called him and he's been on board. And in four weeks, we've done an enormous amount of work. Mm. So, um, you know, and he's around that writing, I mean, all the time. So I'm bringing one thing to the table. He's bringing something else. And thank goodness we really work well together. All right. So let's talk about Puss and Dick, right? So <laughs> Puss and Dick, a survivor's guide to relationships, right? Now, yeah. this is based on your relationship between you and your husband or like loosely based on y'all? 
Oh, yeah. It was originally called Sal and Mo. Mm. But, you know, what does that mean? And actually, as it's developed, remember, it's, it actually started as a gift idea in the early 90s. Okay. I create. What was happening is I saw that a lot of couples, you know, uh, around our age, they were getting married, they were having kids, and what happens is you spend less time, you know, being present for one another. Mm. And so then, okay, well, we'll get away for a weekend, you know, and well, then there's all that pressure, you know, as opposed to the gift was actually um, 12 seduction scenarios mm. written in recipe style that I did in the booklet. I'm also an artist and each recipe as it got more graphic mm. was surrounded by a, a, a pen and ink heart. And I wrote a song called Let My Lips Do the Walking. So that was there, and there was a black garter and a little pillow, and this is eight and a half by eleven. Right, uh, a little pillow with a with a pocket that said um, how to prepare your love, your love. So the idea would be that rather than you know having all this pressure, that you take five minutes a day mm. and just be present for one another. I got investors. Uh, but didn't know how to get it off the ground. But the idea of people communicating better and celebrating our sexuality never left. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I go on in my career, you know, doing voiceover. And back in the day before um, we were using um, iPads for our scripts. And by the way, we still use scripts at South Park. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but they're, you know, you're only getting the segment of what you're doing. Um, I used to... Because it would take so long, especially if you they were dubbing and they weren't using Pro Tools or what it would take forever to get everything to fit. Mm. So I'd sit there and I'd draw and I'd draw all kinds of things. And one of the things, um, how do I say this? I believe that male and female energy, and this is not a new concept. It's the concept of yin yang. Mm. You know, you know if you know what the symbol is. Right. Yeah. Working together. So a lot of the artwork I have, I'm looking around my house, is erotica. Okay. It is. The idea of uh, female within male and growth. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that we complement each other, and yet, right. even in a gay, even in a gay relationship, usually I would think mm. one aspect is going to be more masculine energy, one's going to be more feminine energy. Mm. So, the idea I started drawing these little, this little penis and vagina. <laughs> and I realized that. Um, Okay. That, uh, but they were cute, you know. Cute. Uh, <laughs> cute penis and vaginas. And I, <laughs> I realized that um, nobody would know what in the world Sal and Mo was. Mm. But, you know, a nickname, especially in England, for a <clears throat> vagina is a puss or for a female is a puss. Mm. And Dick is just, you know, it's a common name for Richard. For Richard, right. <laughs> which I will, yeah, which I will never understand, but it is. Okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> so I thought, okay, puss and Dick. And then the more I started developing it in the last, oh gosh, uh, five years, I realized that if, what do we all have in common? Mm. Regardless of, you know, what, who or what we are on the outside, we all lean more toward feminine energy or masculine energy, just like zeros and ones. Mm. So the idea that I could create a, a series based on but not just a couple, mm. because it doesn't matter. It could be it could be um, two friends. <laughs> it could be a, an employer and an employee. And then fast forward to about six weeks ago, mm. I thought this was going to be one puss, one dick <laughs> that they would take on different roles. It's okay. like if you were going to be okay, if you were going to be in an ensemble theater company, mm. one day you might be doing Shakespeare, the next day you might be doing. Uh, uh, well, there, you, you know, every day, you, every week, you'd be somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then because I have been open to ideas, I, I did this pre-pitch at a little place that I love over here called Base Camp High Horse, mm -hmm. Dinette. And I had met some writers, you know, like um, Alex Craven, who ended up really helping me. And Mark, by that time when we did the animatic, I had invited Mark in to punch up the script and to direct. Mm -hmm. It was a little animatic, and that's what I presented, along with what we call an animation Bible. Okay. And Alex said, can I see the Bible, uh, and then how about if we meet next week? And man, he was great. 
Mm. Because he said, you know, you really should get another writer on there and develop it. And then once he did that, everything shifted. So now we have a whole little town. And right now the town is called Humanity Harbor. Mm. And so Mark and I have been working like little busy beavers on redoing the um, Bible. And then my original illustrator, Ani, is right now working on changing up the look. Okay. So this takes an enormous amount of work, but I totally that believe enormous. that it can not only be funny and entertaining, but it can also help people to take a moment and think mm-hmm. about how much communication can make all of our lives better. All you got to do, honey, is look at what's happening in our world. Look at what's happening in the disparity in this country. Mm-hmm. Now, So in- that's really the heart of what it's about. Yeah. Now, in this PC society, do you think the public will be receptive to that kind of brash, in-your-face representation of, like, love? Well, or... South Park hasn't done badly. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but <laughs> but just like... uh, uh... You th- First of all, it's not going to ever be a network show, nor would I want it to yeah, be. Yeah, hell no, 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 no. <laughs> but, you know, if you can, if you can, if the public can accept four little boys who are total hellions mm-hmm. getting into trouble, I don't see why they would have trouble accepting this, especially if the characters are cute and smart. Yeah, you'd be surprised nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing of it is, we all have passion about something, sweetie. Right. And honest to God, I believe that this is something that's working through me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And part of it is, is I do have a good relationship with my husband. I do have a good relationship with the people I work with. And that is all about taking a moment, really listening and focusing and being open to the fact that things that I might need to see things differently. Mm -hmm. Now you think for just a moment, if that was what was going on in this country, especially in politics or, or in any other problematic area from people who don't pick up their dog crap Mm -hmm. to the homeless, you tell me that there's not a need for us to begin to think outside of the box and think differently. Now, that has a lot to do with masculine and feminine energy. Right. Yeah, absolutely when they right. work together. I, I study Tai Chi mm. with a Tai Chi master. God bless him. Um, he's wonderful. And one of the things I have learned is that they, you look at yin energy, which is the feminine, as being weaker, only because it's within. Okay, Mm -hmm. you think about how men and women are wired in terms of genitalia. Mm -hmm. Ours is inside, yours is outside, okay? But the point is, you have more strength when you have yin working with yang than you do just by yang by itself. So without, you know, being preachy and so on and so forth, that's really what I'm trying to get across. Okay, good. So there'll be some people who say, oh, this is about genitalia walking around. I can't do it. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of smart people because I do not think we have a lot of dumb people in the United States. I think we have a lot of ignorant people in the United States. Mm-hmm. But who isn't ignorant about something? We all are. We all are, yeah. Yes. My hope is that we start breaking down those walls and see what our commonality is. Mm-hmm. That's why we've got a puss. They're all pusses or they're all dicks <laughs> because that is pretty damn basic if you think about it. Basically, if you think about it. Now, um, since your voice is your livelihood, what routines or steps do you do to take care of it on like a daily basis? Well, um, I do exercise every single day because mm. so much of that is about breathing. Okay. So I, I do uh, yoga. I do Pilates. I do Tai Chi. And I try and uh, walk almost every day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When you have a dog, you know that you have to do that. Right. And But one of the things I have noticed is I'm very careful about going to parties and events because the tendency is to be talking like this because there's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I try not to go places where they're smoking. I don't drink, not because I don't think it's wonderful, you know, as long as you don't get drunk on your ass every day, right. but it's just not something I do well with. So I don't, I don't, uh, I try and watch my, my food intake. I don't eat a lot of sugar. So basically, you know, you live as healthy a lifestyle as you can, mm-hmm. but I try not to be in places where I'm going to be talking like this a lot because after a while, it really just puts a strain on your vocal system. Right. 
Now, how often do you stay in that creative headspace where you're like listening to everyday voices and trying to craft different characters in your head? I guess I want to say. <laughs> Never stops. Never stops. <laughs> Is that annoying Never though? Stops. After a while? It can be if, if it can, it can be if I don't take breaks. Right. Um, it's one of the reasons why we still have a very healthy sexual relationship. Thank you very much. Hey. I'm glad I <laughs> um, but it helps. You know, it does. And, you know, we have that in common and I'm grateful for that. But, um, I try to do things, um, that I won't go into detail about in terms of being service, uh, being of service outside of myself. And that helps. Mm-hmm. I read to children and that's very creative. So that it's not so much that the voices stop, <clears throat> but if they're directed in a positive way, mm-hmm. then they become positive instead of negative. Right. And also like on this project, you know, you know, I just, it doesn't stop, but it's not interfering. Okay. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this podcast right now. Right. <laughs> I can't do that. I've got to think. Right. So all of that helps. You know, and I love I love the idea of sharing some of the knowledge uh, and um, some of the knowledge that's been helpful to me and some of the technique that's been helpful to me. I love being able to share that with fans or, or with people who are interested now, as a voice actor, what was your first gig? Um, my I think my very first gig. Uh, let me think about this because I'm I'm never sure whether it's. Uh, it was radio, and it was. I think it went like this. I think my first gig was either commentary about the uh, Buddy Holly story Mm. or it was doing a Scottish maid on Heartbeat Theater that Dawes directed. Um, And then my first major gig um, that was SAG was doing the voice replacement for Alexander in um, Bergman, Fanny, and Alexander, and that was really a trip. Hmm. Playing a live-action little boy who I thought was going to be seduced at one point. That was really, <laughs> that was really, uh, <laughs> that was really. Um, I remember they showed us the film first, and I'm going, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be something I'm going to have to talk to somebody about. Hmm. Um, if you know the film as it happens, he does not get seduced, but it's, right. He's a very introspective little boy, and the fact that Bergman really liked what we had done with the dub made me feel good. Mm-hmm. And I was dating Sal then, so Sal's watching the film. He's looking at me. He's going, mm, that really came out of you? Right. <laughs> Who am I dating? <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. Now, how, now how did you meet your husband? I'm sorry? So, so how did you meet your husband, said, Sal? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's a story. It's I a met story. my husband because I'm a very loyal, loving wife, even to my first husband. Okay. <laughs> my first husband, God bless him, was, uh, I think he was bipolar. I oh, I'm with heard, you. But, um, <laughs> there you go. I got the same story. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully, you, if, if you're talking about yourself, you have good meds. Um, <laughs> no, he doesn't. Know. It, and this, uh, uh, that's only a guess on my part. But you're right, he, right. He had this pattern where he would get very enthusiastic about something. And I was the primary breadwinner. He would get very enthusiastic about something and then he would drop it. Mm. So he had difficulty hanging on to a job and it was a very bright man. Um, so, and I had met him in college. Mm. It was my first husband. So he had gotten involved in a personal business and was very enthusiastic. He liked the fact that um, it applied spiritual principles to a business uh, set, and I thought, so finally, being a supportive wife, mm. I went with him to one of these meetings, and he was dead on, and of course, being the person I am, it was exactly the opposite, um, I got involved to be a supportive wife, right. and he, as he, as his pattern, he dropped it, and by that time, we had other people that were involved, and so on and so forth, and his sister-in-law had come into town and was looking for a small business that she could start without it costing a lot of money. Mm. So I brought her to this meeting. Now, let me backtrack. I have been a club singer. I've written my own stuff. 
I am a firm believer in that if you make a commitment to somebody, you live up to that commitment. Right. And there's no way in hell I would ever have cheated on my husband. That's not to say that during the years I was married to my first husband, I was attracted to other men. I certainly was. When you're out performing and guys are, you know, telling you how wonderful you are, it's easy to, you know, buy into that. Mm. rather than realize it's a line and you're committed. Right. So I never acted on that. And I used to be very attracted to very intelligent men, or you know, guys that were... So I had been talking to the woman who's been a spiritual guide for me for many, many years, mm. uh, and I knew the marriage was deteriorating. And she kept telling me, you must either accept that your first husband... I mean, obviously, there was no second husband. Your your husband is never going to change. Right. <laughs> and accept that fact, or you have to make a decision to move on. So I was getting ready to ask him for a separation. Mm-hmm. My friend suggested to me that I wait until my sister-in-law left town. Okay. <laughs> I went to this meeting, took one look at Sal Iannotti, and oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> smitten. Uh, I was more than smitten. I mean, I <laughs> he had... I'm an artist, and he has this face with a long jaw, and I just uh, wanted to touch his face. Right. <laughs> so at that point, I knew <laughs> it was time to go home and ask uh, my first cousin for a divorce. Uh, not, uh, not a divorce, a separation. So I did. Oh, yeah, you got to go. I said, um, <laughs> well, no, I did not say it, it was not that. Right. <laughs> Clayton, I said, I think we should separate. Hmm. He said, uh, he said, Okay. Okay. <laughs> Damn, that's um, it. <laughs> and by the way, I had gotten I had heard rumor that he was thinking about having an affair with somebody oh, unbeknownst shit. to me. So I was not feeling too bad about this. <laughs> right. And uh, so um so I said, Okay, then you have to move out. He said, Why? I said, Because I pay the rent. Goddamn so right. It took him about three weeks. In the meantime, Sal was calling me every morning and we would just talk. That's all we did was talk. Mm. And we got to know each other and uh and then my then husband moved out and about a few weeks later, was already moved in with another woman. Mm. So oh, at that point, I guy. thought, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See what it is now. <laughs> so that is how I met my first husband. Right. <laughs> Shout out to Sal. I like Sal. Slightly naughty, too. <laughs> right. I mean, hey, but, um, it is what it is. It happens to the best of us. But I will say this. I really needed to know who he was before I... And, and this is just me, you know? Yeah. I, I did not grow up in the age of, oh, wow, I like you. You're attractive. Let's group right. um, i wanted to make sure that it was somebody um you know that i really cared about and who cared about me mm. so oh sweet love puss and dick that's love <laughs> <laughs> you betcha baby yeah. it comes from love but the thing of it is is all of us can come from that place right i mean seriously you think about it you take a moment to really get to know somebody there'd be many fewer divorces right yeah yeah so many and a lot happier marriages Shut up, man. Mom, you okay? <laughs> Mom, you okay over there, man? All right. Now, oh, uh, I wish I had a tape of you guys right now. <laughs> <laughs> nah, because well, uh, when she said about the um her husband being bipolar, I had a I had a wife that was bipolar, so I know exactly what that <laughs> feels like. <laughs> oh man, I can't. it's hard. Yeah, if you were dealing with somebody who is bipolar, and see, I didn't even know that. Mm. I mean, you you, you got to remember, you're going back a lot of years. Right. Bipolar, I think more people knew about bipolar because there were so many actors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Once I realized so what that pattern was, later on I realized that that was probably what was going on. But I also had a sister and a father. My father was, a, um, his background was, he was Lithuanian Jew. Mm. I mean, he wasn't from Lithuania. His, his uh, parents were. Okay. He had bipolar genes. My sister had bipolar genes. Her children and her grandchildren are all bipolar. But by her, by the time she had her her children, there was medication available. Mm-hmm. People knew what it was. My poor sister, nobody knew what, why she was having tantrums and why she was, you know, why she couldn't cope. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as a matter of fact, she did get help. She did leave a, a, a lead a somewhat productive life. We never had a relationship, but her children and their children at least have the awareness and the means to get help. Mm. But that's a terrible disease to have to live with, right? You know, and, and once again, it's a mental illness, so people are very non-accepting. Goes back to what am I trying to do with Adventures of Puss and Dick? Right. I'm trying to <laughs> at least give people an awareness, so that we're not about excluding people, about but about including them 
in the society and being able to understand and help. Mm. Not everybody fits into a little freaking box. Right. Now, speaking on bipolar and things like that, are like voice actors allowed to have a bad day because everything you're going through comes through the mic and, you know, you have to obviously use your voice and some days you're just not there mentally. Um, that's really a question for a producer. I have never, I have never shown up to a session, um, not able to put aside what's going on with me mm. to be present. Okay. Now I did have one incident. Um, I had had knee surgery and I was due to see my doctor that afternoon because it kept oozing. Mm. And I got myself to the studio. Fortunately, it was, you know, I was the only one involved. So it wasn't like, oh my gosh, there's a whole group depending on me as well. Um, and it was, um, I think it was a, the director was being Skyped in from, uh, I think Korea. Mm. And I got to the session and the engineer took one look at me and said, Oh, I think you need to go home. Mm. And uh, at first I didn't want to, but I was in such pain. Um, that I, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I, I literally, I, I agreed to go home and we rescheduled. Mm. Um, and literally, I, fortunately it wasn't a long distance, but I oozed. There was ooze as mm. I was, got back to the car. How I made it home, I'm, I, I don't know. And I had already arranged for a friend of mine to take me to the doctor and they, uh, they put me in the hospital that right. day. Mm. It was an infection. But, you know, I was taught early on in theater. That A, anybody can be replaced. Mm. B, this is a privilege to be able to use what you love to earn your living. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, you know, and directors and producers, unless you're under the gun. Oh, my God, I got a South Park story to tell you. Um, do you remember the season where um, Kyle's mother broke the Internet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was very rough. I had a sinus infection. Trey was also sick. And a lot of, you know how things are, you know, you're working closely with a lot of people and they work long hours. There were a lot of, there was a lot of, a lot of people were sick and I was called in early to do lines for her. I think. All right. So their, their new week begins on a Thursday mm. and it ends on Tuesday night. So that Thursday I'd gone in thinking, I think it was, it was either Thursday or I think it was Thursday. Hmm. And I was doing a lot of shouting and I had a sinus infection. If I shout and the sinus infection is, is too far in, uh -huh. um, I can lose my voice. Uh, hmm. So I did the best I could, knowing that we can always pick up lines, but do, do the best I could, thinking, oh, they won't call me in until Saturday. Hmm. I got a call from my agent that they needed me Friday afternoon. I said, Arlene, I, I, I am really afraid. I am not going to have the voice. So they were, they would have gotten somebody to do a rough, but they, they decided, well, let's wait till Saturday. So I rested and did everything in my power, took a lot of emergency, took a lot of tea, everything I could to get my voice in shape. So Saturday morning, I show up. And Trey's there too, not feeling well. Right. So we did it. And then anything we needed to pick up, uh, we picked up Tuesday. But that, I gotta tell you, because that is such a tight schedule, you're talking about Tuesday night airing the next day. The next day, yeah. There is no wiggle room there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. With the job that I, I had to reschedule, there's wiggle room, mm. you know, um, on a game. There is no job in town that has this kind of deadline. None. Yeah, because South Park is pretty no, fast. No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> a quick turnaround. I was gonna, I was gonna ask that because a lot of times, like something will happen during the week, <clears> and <throat> South Park will pick up on it on the next new episode. Like it could happen maybe Sunday mm -hmm. or Monday, and they're already yeah. up on it. So, are when when that happens, are there a lot of like rewrites and just like schedule conflicts with with certain voice actors, or do you guys just is that well, is that in your remember, country? Who's going to book book me besides South Park at ten o'clock on a Tuesday night? I don't know. <laughs> you never know. I don't know. I don't live in Hollywood. I don't know what happens. No. <laughs> um, and here's the thing: when South Park is in session, I don't go out of town. Okay. It used to be when that when the schedule is different uh, that I would go back to Philadelphia during um, 
Thanksgiving. Mm. But when the guys got married and they started having their own kids, <laughs> right. the schedule changed. Mm. But they used to record me in um, in Philadelphia uh. Uh, f- for that time. And also, I remember Chef was, was recorded out of New York. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He very rare, rarely was in L.A. So they knew that they could do that. Mm. It's just it's so much easier when you don't have to do that. Mm. And now that my father-in-law has passed away, we don't go back to Philly anyway. And they're always off on, on uh, Thanksgiving. Okay. Mm. Which is nice. You know, I mean, every, you got to remember, <clears throat> everybody who started, you know, 22, 23 years ago, they were all, you know, in their early yeah. 20s. Yeah. Yeah. Now so many of the, the people working that show are married and have children and have family. You know, so they have um, week breaks in between, which is nice. Okay. I mean, I think they have two or three mm. one week breaks in between the ten shows. Mm, okay. Now, do you have a dream role that you want to play? Yes. What's that? The many aspects of puss and puss and. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to play the puss. I'm not joking. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, one I know you're serious. Great job. Uh huh. That, I mean, I'm being serious. I want to write and I want to produce my my own show with mm. a, a wonderful group of people and uh, do a lot of the characters on it. Okay, so that's Especially, your passion uh, project right uh, now. My puss and dick. Huh? <laughs> so, so so that's your passion project at this moment. No, that is my po- passion project for the rest of my life. Mm. Not to say I don't like doing a lot of other stuff. I do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I've got a, a thing coming up, a, a game, and the character is wonderful. <laughs> she's she's mad. Uh-uh. I'm playing a mad woman. Uh-uh. Can you speak on it? So, or? yeah, I mean, I, lo- I, lo- I love doing what I'm doing, but you, you asked me what my dream job is. That's it. I mean, I, in writing these characters and working these characters characters out with Mark and with our illustrator, you know, it's, it's exciting. Mm-hmm. It's really exciting to, you know, because I'm thinking, you know, I want to keep the cast down to people who can do multiple voices. Because to me, that's an actor's dream. Mm. You kidding me? Doing multiple voices on a show? Right. <laughs> it's the best. Now, are you able yeah. to speak on the game that you're working on at all or no? Uh, this game, yes. It's called Moons of Madness. And okay. there's a couple other ones that are in and there's this. Guess a few guest shots on a Disney thing I can't talk about. Mm. But um, what I know about Moons of Madness is it, it seems very, very well written. Mm. Um, I'm not sure what company it is, but when I went in to do her the first time, I asked if I could talk about it. And um, it's being directed by Rob King, who's just really wonderful. Mm. I've known him for years. And, you know, it's wonderful to play a mad woman. Right. <laughs> Basically, I'm trying to kill my son. <laughs> Sounds like a game I want to play. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> now, um, one of the most fun games I ever did that was doing Helga on uh, Ratchet and Clank. I loved. That's oh, what you're going to do now. Yeah. <laughs> Come here, let me look at you. That's fucking insane. <laughs> I didn't know that. I, I got to do more research. I'm stupid. <laughs> so now, um. Yeah. Stupid. I know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> another thing I wanted to ask now, you do the voices for fun on YouTube. Now, do you teach classes outside of doing that on YouTube or? I that... do on, um, on Skype, uh, not Skype, on, uh, what's it called? Hangout? I do. Uh, that's what I wanted you guys to use. Uh, oh, I, um, if you go Google? online, uh, Zoom? I do it online. Oh, Zoom. Zoom. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah. I'm glad one of us has a mind <laughs> this afternoon. Um, yeah, I do it on Zoom, and it actually works out really well. Mm. Um, you have to remember that the class I teach is about production. This is not a class you want to take every week. Right. It's a class you might want to take two, three times a year. Okay. okay. Because what I want to teach you is how to do stuff that you can use every single day. Okay. And then you play with that. I had a guy... Just wonderful. He was in the army, 23 years old. Really didn't have much training mm. in this area, but boy, he had a really he had a really good ear, mm. which meant he could do impressions, which you often need because a lot of times you'll start with an impression and then riff from there. Right. This guy was so good, and I encouraged him. I said, "Come up with five characters, work on the placements for them, and start doing it as stand up." Hmm. Start using them as stand-up because that's a good way to get seen and a good way, you know, if you're not being hired. And plus, when he gets out of the Army, I'm sorry, he was a Marine. Hmm. He was a Marine. Um, you know, it's it's a good thing to then 
really pursue because as a Marine, he could pursue it a little bit in terms of going, you know, when they go, go out, he can do stand up, you know, cause they have open mic. Mm-hmm. So I really encourage that. You know, it's, it's wonderful. Either that or get with a good improv cl- uh, group. Right. Or class. Mm, okay. Where are you guys from? Connecticut. New York. Connecticut, oh, Connecticut. That's nice. You're not far from New York. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, it's, it's an hour train ride. It's not that far. Yeah. So are you guys all, all into doing voiceover or acting? Are you an ensemble group? What are you? Um, Basically just three podcasts. Um, we do, um, if you, I, I suggest that you never listen to our show. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we do uh, do like voices every now and then. You know, we're pretty animated. We're pretty, you know, <clears throat> out there and wayward group of black men <laughs> I, don't, I don't i don't know how else to put it we're like we're we're very animated and out there we uh trying to trying to ruffle some feathers i guess so let me ask you a question can you do any white guy voices uh yeah on command probably not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I would, I would. my my close friend across the street xavier x mm. she and i walk our dog right now she is a black woman from the south originally mm. And every once in a while, we'd be walking, and X will come on with a white valley girl like you would not believe. <laughs> she is not an actor, honey. <laughs> right. She's not. So, so we do lots of play together. Sometimes they're two little black girls. Sometimes they're nasty little white teenagers. Right. We have a lot of fun. Yeah, we, yeah, we do and different that's, that's a lot of it, too. You got to have fun. Yes, yeah, sir. Got to have fun. It's a lot that goes on in in the studio. So. Yeah, we don't think we're getting anywhere. No, we, I, mean, oh, I think I can tell that from here. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a lot going on now. Um, we definitely does, have fun. Yeah, yeah. We, we definitely have fun now. Does Puss and Dick have a have a uh, a date that is coming out, or is it still in production right now? No, because remember we're in the stages of developing a strong enough pitch and Bible because we got to then go oh, to yeah, the people, right? right? Uh, you know, the people that actually say, "Here's money to do this." <laughs> And so I've been very fortunate. Like I said, Alexander Craven, um, uh, who's a guy, you know, I just met. We were, we were talking one day at this place that I hang out. Um, he gave me some really good advice and he's been kind of uh, mentoring us along, Mark and I. Mm. Um, and we're hoping that we have strong enough pitch that somebody says, okay, here's money to do X amount of them and we'll get it on air. Mm-hmm. So you guys out there, keep your fingers crossed because I think this could really be a lot of fun. We're looking forward to it. So now, Mona, um, where can everyone find you on the Instagrams and the social medias and YouTube and things like on that? On Instagram. Well, let me see, because I want to make sure I don't screw this up or my media consultant may kill me. <laughs> um, I not, have my little card right here. We'll plug it in. Okay, on, <laughs> you got it. Thank you. Please plug me. Yeah. <laughs> plug me as much as you want. Okay, on Instagram, it's um, Mona Marshall Voices. Okay. And on Twitter, it's the Mona Marshall. Okay. How about uh, YouTube? And you can also go to my website, um, which is, uh, and there you can actually, uh, your fans can write if they want. I sell autographed pictures, and mm. they can find out about, um, you know, one-on-one lessons. Um, and that's monamarshall.net. Okay. All right. Okay. Mona, I enjoyed this conversation. I I really appreciate you for the laughs that you've given us in in this episode in in South Park for for these many many years. It was an honor and a okay. privilege to talk to you. Well, same at you. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Keep having lots of fun and getting it out there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You have a good You're day. All right. Take care now. <clears throat> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.